without further ado, Nivi, let's give him a round of applause and get him on up here. Uh, Nivi, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for coming. And uh, why don't we just kind of briefly start off? How many folks here um, already know what AngelList is? And how many of you have uh, your company listed on AngelList already? Okay. And show of hands, how many of you um, are actively looking to raise money for your company in the next three to six months? All right, so you got a good sense of the room. We've got a lot of entrepreneurs. We've got a lot of folks who are in the process of raising money. Um, why don't we start off with just a bit of background, really briefly, about what Venture Hacks is, what AngelList is, and then we'd love to get more of the background about you yourself. Sure. Uh so Venture Hacks is a blog. I don't know if you guys have checked it out. The whole goal of it is to level the playing field between entrepreneurs and VCs when you're raising your round. So uh, I, I raised a round for a company called Songbird around 2007, and I got a lot of good advice along the way. One of them from uh, my co-founder, Naval, at AngelList, uh, from some really good lawyers, uh, just great Ad advisors and I felt I had access to advice that nobody else had, uh, basically on how to out-negotiate your investors. Uh, tricks like the fact that they put the option pool in the pre-money, which screws you in two or three different ways. Uh, if you've raised a round, you know this, but if you haven't, uh, investors are going to take advantage of you. And uh, even if you have raised a round, you might not know how to uh, out-negotiate them on that point. Uh, so we, we started the blog to open source all the best startup advice we had, in particular around negotiating term sheets with VCs and with angels. That's Venture Hacks. And then AngelList just came out of, uh, uh, N Naval and I both have like a multi-year frustration with venture capital. Uh, I've worked in VC for, uh, since 2000 and I've never been good at it. Uh, and uh, I kind of hated it because they don't uh, use computers or hire developers. <laughs> I, I mean, they use computers, they, 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 they email, but the state of the art is email. Uh, and I guess they're on Twitter now. So uh, what we always wanted to have is an online liquid marketplace where a startup could go, put their profile up, and if they were worthy, investors would come and knock on their door and say, I want to meet you. Uh, so that's what AngelList does now. Uh, we do one more thing as well. Well, a couple more things. We do the same exact thing with talent. So if you're hiring, you put up the same exact pro profile. You say you're hiring, and talent comes and knocks on your door and says, I want to meet you. And then we also do the same thing with incubators, too. You can now use it to apply to incubators. Cool. Uh, so let's talk about your background for a little bit. Um, where'd you grow up? Uh, Canada, England. Um, Iran, Boston. And then where did, where did you kind of, where did you go to undergrad at? Uh, MIT and U of M. I transferred. Did you study engineering? Yeah, electrical engineering, computer science, math, which by the way is not very useful in my experience. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not even kidding. Well, uh, I mean, it is funny, but I'm not kidding. Uh, when did you finish undergrad at? Uh, 96, and then to compound the problem, I stayed in the PhD program until 2000, and I, until I dropped out, which was one of the smarter things I've done. Uh, like the two smartest things I've done, or well, I don't know two, the two smartest, but two smart things I've done in my life are dropping out of the PhD program and then uh, moving to San Francisco. Did you? Though I'm here half time now, so don't. Uh, it's not a. It's not a. Yeah. Did you um, have the entrepreneurial bug early on, or did it develop as time went on? Because you, you started doing investments right before you had started the company, or did you start a company first? Uh, well, I first tried to start a company when I dropped out of school. I tried to start a company that was doing on uh, mobile privacy. This is in 2000. Uh, WAP was just starting to come out. It's before your time, but uh, mobile, somebody's laughing. Uh, <laughs> M mobile privacy was an issue, or at least in my head. 
Uh, and then we tried to start a company around uh, open source hardware. So there's, so there's open source so software. We figured, why don't we do open source hardware? Uh, both of those were Is that just, like you could just go into somebody's office and take their computer and <laughs> then yeah, somebody else goes could, and takes the computer as well? And I don't think anybody's done that, so we okay. might want to try that. Uh, and both of those were complete disasters in the sense that like nothing happened because I just really, I started it for all the wrong re re reasons. I started it to start a company as opposed to like ha having some insane uh, illogical passion to solve the problem. How, did you raise money for those companies? Uh, I think from my dad, I raised money. <laughs> so, is there a blog for that so, that you write so, about as well? So, are, there, are there ways to negotiate with your father? So, sorry, dad. By the way, I would prefer to negotiate with venture capitalists than most Persian fathers, just for the record. Okay, so. yeah, yeah, that's fair. Um, Persian hacks, we're gonna get around to that. That's we're gonna, a good idea. We're gonna get around to writing that as well, too. All right, so you start the first two businesses, they don't go ex exactly as planned. You want to start a company and have a passion, then what happens afterwards? Uh, yeah, so they don't go according to plan, as in they're a complete disaster, and then I got it into my head that... What does a complete disaster really mean? Like, nothing happened, nothing, there was a waste of everybody's time, I wasted other people's time. Uh, the, the, maybe it's not a disaster, nobody died. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, then I got it into my head that I wanted to work in venture capital, because I thought, well, this sounds like a great job. You get to sit down, and people come to you, and you evaluate their ideas. Yeah, there are other jobs where you get to sit, right? It's not the only job. Right, yeah. You actually get to sit throughout the day. Yeah, no, that's fair. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, uh, well, there's also the Blackberries that they had, which yes. is pretty cool. And then, uh, so I thought, yeah, this is what I, what, what I want to do. V, VC, I'll be like the king, and entrepreneurs will come and to me. How old are you at this time? Uh, it was in 2001. So you're like 25, this is, right? This is going really slow, this is history. Yeah. All right, so 25, you want to be a king. How did, how did you get that VC? Everyone wants to be a VC, you know, but the hard part is breaking in. How did you actually do it? Uh, that was tough. It took six months. Uh, I just uh, worked the MIT angle. I just talked to everybody, and although I was uh, desperately underqualified, uh, somebody gave me the job as an associate. Mm -hmm. Um, cause, what firm? Because I think the, f the firm was about to run out of money, so it didn't matter really that, <laughs> <laughs> that, that much. Um, but the guy who gave me the job, Jeff Fagnan, is, uh, he, I, I've been working with him since then. He's now at Atlas Venture, which is a big fund in Boston, and he basically restarted that fund. So he's an amazing guy. He gave me a, my first chance in VC. Uh, uh, how long did you do the VC gig for? Uh, Year, years on and off, but that was not good either. I wasn't, it, like I said, I really wasn't into it uh, because I just didn't like the way they worked. It was so old fashioned where their the technology co companies were coming to them to raise money, but they themselves were using no technology. They had no e engineers. They weren't trying to advance the state of the art of their own industry in any way. And they still don't. I mean, it's like 13 years later, the industry is the same as it was in 1960 or 50 when it started. Uh, there's a little innovation go going on. Uh, Google Ventures is pretty cool. Uh, Andreessen Horowitz is pretty cool. In what do you terms think of, those guys are actually doing differently? Uh, in, in, and, and by the way, there's lots of good guys in lots of firms that I like and are my friends. It's just they're not particularly innovative from the entrepreneur's perspective. Uh, what do I like about Andreessen Horowitz and Google? It's, I, I think it's one thing, uh, or maybe a couple. One is uh, they offer services to entrepreneurs. So like they've got recruiting teams, they've got PR teams, uh, they've got whatever the hell else you need. Uh, uh, Google has engineering and scaling teams, they have design teams at Google, uh, and those teams are good, uh, especially at Google. Uh, because uh, you know, Google has this whole Google Ventures has this side business, this thirty billion dollar ad business on the side, where they're quite operationally proficient. Uh, so they give you access to that expertise, um, and I and I imagine Andreessen Horowitz what, what is the same. What do you think of Google? Kind of, I, I've heard from a lot of entrepreneurs they kind of hold the carrot out, you know, when they want a deal of 
um, hey, you know, you're going to get these special treatments from Google, you'll get access, you're going to get all these things, but then publicly, that you know, they say it's just walled garden, the two things have nothing to do with each other. Is oh. that in any way a conflict or not really? Uh, I'm, I'm not too sure, but, uh, you know, as they say, no conflict, no interest. This doesn't, it doesn't worry me. Got it. Okay. <laughs> Who cares? So you were I doing that for uh, a couple years on and off. Were you doing entrepreneurial stuff in that time as well? Uh, I started a band. You can get the CD. <laughs> <laughs> what was uh, the band? <laughs> Nitlings.com, N-I-T-L-I-N-G-S. I think all the music's there for free. What kind of music? Uh, uh, it's like music? garage rock. We recorded a CD in my bedroom, uh, which was fun. Uh, so I did that kind of stuff, goofed around. Uh, and, then in two, and then I moved here in 2006 or so to L.A. Uh, I thought, well, I'll get into entertainment. Uh, that sounds like fun. I like film and t t TV, which I do. Um, and I didn't like that either because that was also just a very old-fashioned industry, right? It's a little more advanced than the VC industry, but uh, fairly old-fashioned. Somebody told me to go check out San Francisco. I fell in love with it because it's just very, uh, in, you know, it's a very intellectual city to a degree, kind of like uh, Boston or Cambridge. Um, so I moved there, ended up getting a job at a VC fund called Bessemer with David Cowan. Uh, that also took six months of just knocking on doors. Um, I don't know if you want me to continue this. Or no, I mean, just go up to the point of when you started the first company. That's fine. Well, I worked on Songbird, where, where we raised cash from Sequoia. That's where we learned all the tricks that we talk about in, in Venture Hacks. Then after that, I just took a year off to write down all the tricks on our blog. And we tried to start AngelList around 2007 or so, uh, a bunch of times. We frankly tried it three or four times before we got it right over many years. Uh, and a lot of it had to do with building the right product for the market, but a lot of it also had to do with we were just operationally incompetent. By, by we, I mean me. It was just me at that point in time and, and an engineer. What about uh, Naval? He was there as like a super advisor, as a co-founder and mega advisor, but he had his fund at the time. Got it. Uh, which we, he was fo focused on. So first we built software. Uh, that kind of worked, but we had no deal flow. Then we started, we tried doing it as a Google group, whatever, maybe that'll work. Uh, we tried it on Yammer, don't ask me why. Uh, and then... Uh, we tried AngelList on Yammer? Yeah, we're like, I mean, all it is, I mean, it's a communication platform, right? So we're like, maybe we can make this work on Yammer somehow. This is like 2000 and, I don't know, eight, nine, and... Uh, my le le level of sophistication in building software was quite uh, poor. Um, and then uh, I think I was pitching Naval on an idea one day. I'm like, oh, you know what? I'm going to write some PDF, and I'm going to sell it for $19. And he's like, I don't care. Uh, you, you, know, you know what we should do? Uh, <laughs> he's like, let's just make a list of investors on like a web page. Uh, because people ask me all the time, who should I raise cash from? I'll just send them a URL, right? Uh, so the first version was we made a Wufu form. You guys know Wufu. It's like Google Forms, uh, but it costs money uh, for some reason. Uh, but so we, so we made a Wufu form, and we emailed it to 20 of our closest friend investors, good guys, angels, um, that you'd, whose names you'd re recognize, and we just had them fill in the form. What's your name? Where are you? How many investments are you going to make this year? What markets do you like? How do you add value? Uh, and then I just copy and pasted all of those into a blog post. And that was, the, that was AngelList for about two or three months of me copying and, and pasting stuff from WooFu. So literally just a list of angels. Yeah and, yeah, and the name also, that took us like five seconds. Obviously, the name is not great, but we're kind of stuck with it right now. Um, so that was the first rev that worked. And did you have their contact information on the blog post? Uh, the first version, uh, they had, we had their email addresses on there. And qu very quickly, they're like, can you take my email address <laughs> off, please? Uh, then we're like, OK, how do we let startups get in touch? We made a separate Wufu form for them. We had the startups fill it in. We manually vetted every single deal. We just looked at the deal. I remember the first co company that showed up was Something to do with like helping people stop smoking, which we'll, uh, uh, we, would, we did not send to investors because it wasn't going to happen. Uh, 
But uh, that's how it worked in, it, initially. It was an email list to the investors. We picked the companies. We emailed them to the investors. The, email, the investors would reply back and say, uh, can you introduce me to this company? And then I had like a canned intro email. And I personally did all the intros. So like a couple hundred intros a week. You know. You're doing that many intros a week even early on. Yeah, yeah, because back then it was like uh, this whole seed investing thing that's popular now, uh, that was just starting to ha take off. Like there wasn't this massive market for seed deals like there is now. There was maybe one incubator at the time. Uh, so it was very novel for investors to get reasonable quality deal flow. But there was that period that if you got promoted on AngelList, it was kind of like gold, right? If your company got on there, I feel like it was like two years ago. It's still gold. But, but, but I'm, saying now, I'm saying now the difference is it's more of a self-serve platform. You can go oh, on there. Oh, good. You can yeah. put yourself on there. Yeah. And so you can be on AngelList it's true. without being yes. promoted on AngelList. Yeah, right. Uh, so you can uh, serve yourself, absolutely. That works pretty well. Um, and then we also feature companies still. So I'd say half the dollar volume through the site happens on companies that we feature, and the, the other half happens through self service. So right now we're matching around uh, 10 to 15 million dollars a month. And about, let's say, one startup a day raises part of their capital on AngelList how, how every many, day. How many companies total have raised money through AngelList? It's a good question. We don't really track it. Uh, about, uh, it's in the thousands. It's somewhere between two to three thousand. They've raised part of their round on the site. And uh, it's a good list of Companies, guys like Uber raised their first round on the site. Artsy raised their first round on the site. I can pull up a list of LA companies that have raised cat. Uh, I'm not going to do it, but uh, it's a good list of companies. Yeah. And so, it, it, I wish we invested in some of them. Yeah. Which we and don't. So, in the beginning, were you doing it literally just as a hobby? Where were you, where were you making money? Where had you been making money in the process, or, or where do you even make money on it today? We, we, it's the classic internet business model. We, we, don't, we, don't, we, we don't make any money, uh, at least right now. Um, and uh, we, we, we are never going to charge startups to raise money on the platform. That would, uh, it's just not uh, why we're here. We're here to serve startups is really our mission. Um, so we're not going to charge them for that. It would also be stupid because all the good startups will stop using the platform to raise money. Uh, so we've said that we're not going to do that. Uh, we might, I mean, one possible place that we can uh, make money is on uh, helping companies find talent. So we're matching, like, we, we, we set up about 8,000 meetings a month on that right now. So the way it works, it's like hot or not. You, you look at the candidates. You say, I like you, I like you, I like you, or Tinder. You guys use Tinder. Uh, and then if the other side says, I like you, uh, we do an intro. Unfortunately, I don't personally do those intros anymore. <laughs> Got it. And, and, and what's your vision of what you, what you imagine AngelList to be three to five years out from today? Uh, what we would like to build is a, uh, we're here to serve startups. I would love to have a Craigslist for startups and uh, businesses in general. So it's just matchmaking for any business need. So I need a recruiter, I need a lawyer, I need an advisor, I need a uh, real estate space. Show, show me where the offices are that are open. I need investors, I need an incubator, um, I need a life, whatever. <laughs> uh, so it, it, imagine the Craigslist homepage, which is like all of these hundreds almost of mm -hmm. uh, ver verticals. Uh, I'd love to do that for businesses in general. Just so th that, that way startups can focus on what they do best, which is build their product, and we'll do the rest for them almost, or at least ease, ease their way. Got it. And so, so let's talk about some of the, let's kind of go backwards to venture hacks. Um, and we'll go into kind of some more of the general trends, but maybe we could detail for everybody here, because again, quick show of hands, how many of you are in the fundraising process? Could we, could we break down for these folks your top you know, two or three pieces of advice, the things that A, they need to do to actually close their rounds, but B, as they get to the, to the term sheet process, what things they need to be thinking of? What are the things that, you know, when you want the money, you're just so anxious to get it, you're so happy, 
but sometimes whatever's put in front of you, like, okay, I'll do it, and then later on, you look to regret not being more diligent in that process. Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I assume most people are raising their seed rounds, not, not a Series A, seed rounds. Uh, you mean negotiating the deal? Is that, is that what you're talking about? Let, let's, let's start with negotiating sure. the deal, yeah. I, I guess the first thing I would say is uh, have something worth investing in uh, because that generates demand, uh, which generates multiple offers, which generates options. So the best negotiation tool in the world is having an alternative. So you can walk away from the deal that's in front of you. So. Um, the number one trick you can do to raise money is just have a great company. I know that's not the, the advice you necessarily want to hear, but that's where I would spend all my time. Um, then, if you're raising a seed round, I would say it's probably going to be, uh, there's a good chance it's going to be a party round where there's a lot of people in the deal. Um, and. Uh, what I would just say is uh, you want to devote yourself to raising capital. It's not a, you can't do it. It's next to impossible to do it as like a side job, doing one thing while you're also raising capital, which I know you're, everyone has to do when they're a uh, founder, especially if you're a sole founder. But if you have a co-founder, you can split up the work potentially. Uh, it's usually a full-time job. I would go to market. I would think of yourself as going to market. And that, that, that means talking to everybody you possibly can at once and asking for introductions. That's the offline ver, 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 version. At the same time, I would be on angel list. Uh, if you want to be featured, bug me, and we'll tell you whether or not we think we can feature you right now. What's the best way someone can bug you? Email me. You can figure it out. It's not hard. Um, that, that works. Uh, the message button on AngelList actually f to message me always works, so you can always me message me. Um, and uh, go to a a a AngelList. I would also just have an AngelList profile and use that as your business plan. I think having a standard business plan or deck or whatever is kind of dumb when you can just use your a AngelList profile. I know I'm talking my own book, but that's why we built the site. Um, and the beauty of it is it's like, uh, it's a, uh, the nice thing about using your AngelList URL is it's real time. You can update it and everybody gets the updates, right? So you don't send a deck and then two weeks la later it's out of date. And the especially cool thing about it is if you get an advisor or a new team member or a new investor, you tag them and they show up on the profile which again, everybody sees, and all that dudes or uh, dudettes followers on AngelList will see that they joined your company as an investor advisor and so on. Um, and they verify it. So it's like uh, the, the guy that you're saying so-and-so is investing in our company doesn't have to just take your word for it. What, what are you seeing right now as the, as the median deal terms for? Uh, By the way, did I answer your question or? Yeah, no. you did. We're gonna, I'm going to keep asking more questions, okay. so don't worry about it. That's my job. Your job is to answer them. My job is to ask. Yeah. Uh, what are you seeing right now is the median uh, uh, terms, valuation terms for a seed deal, right? It seemed like it went to, as of a couple months ago, you were seeing, I, it seemed like a lot of the deals that I were hearing at, you talked about seed deals that started at a pre of five or six. Yeah. And, and now it feels like that's come down. Uh, I think it depends on what you have. Say you're coming out of a good incubator. Uh, I think somewhere three, four is not unreasonable. And, and there's for also what size there's also outliers all over the place, right? So I'm sure there's 15 million, 20 million pre's coming out of incubators and otherwise. And what are you seeing as the typical seed si seed stage round? Mm. Uh, how what what's uh, how much are they raising? Oh, by the way, to answer your qu question, you, go, you can go to angel.co, our URL, slash valuations. Uh, so we have a nice valuation visualizer. Uh, you can type in, like, this is the market I'm in, uh, this is where I am, et cetera. And we, this is what incubator I just got out of. Uh, and it tells you what the historical valuations are. Uh, really cool. <clears throat> and it's real time. Angel.co forward slash valuations. Yeah, yeah. It's also in the top nav. You can find it. Uh, so that's a better answer than what I just told you. Uh, what was the question? I'm just going to think of questions where you can point me to URLs for the rest of the time instead of you having to We've actually. Got, 
Do you want to know? We'll do you want to know what the salary and equity to pay an engineer? Go to slash salaries. That's, that's. Yeah, talk, talk about in the actual in the actual deal terms. You have an interested party or parties. Oh, how much do you raise? That's what you were. Yeah, what do you under, see? The, uh, uh, see deal. I think uh, two hundred and fifty to a million is. That's what you're seeing Fair range. Got it. Um, let's talk about the a little bit some of the nitty gritties that you'll see on Venture Hacks. You have an interested party or parties. You're at the point where you have a term oh, sheet. Yeah. What are the two or three things that the folks in this room don't know about that are going to come back later to haunt them that you're going to that you're going to give them the best advice they're ever going to get right now? Uh, well, I would say uh, <clears throat> for a seed deal, oftentimes you can write the term sheet yourself. This is probably the best advice I can give you. You get to set the terms, the initial terms at least. Uh, so. There's actually a good post on Venture Hacks on how to raise a seed round. Just just kind of walks you through the whole process. Uh, but and real quick, it, it, how many of you have have not gone to Venture Hacks? Okay, uh, I, I'm genuinely not saying this just because he's here because I'm happy to talk shit about him in front of his face. All right, you're supposed to laugh at that. So we're gonna take a drink here. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Uh, Venture Hacks is. Uh, the single most definitive, thorough, and best source of information on how to raise money from angel investors and VCs. If you are raising money and you are not reading it, you are doing yourself a major disservice. It is, it is really the absolute best education online. You've got blogs of Mark Suster's, both sides of the table that talk about it. Fred Wilson, I think it's great to get a VC perspective as well. Um, Fred Wilson's blog is AVC. Mark Susser is both sides of the table. Okay. Um, ben Horowitz from Andreessen Horowitz has a great blog, but still the absolute best content I've ever read online around deal terms, interacting with VCs, courting them, raising money is on Venture Hack. So you should all be checking it out this evening. Yeah, uh, yeah the real thing for a seed round, the rounds are not, the negotiation is not that adversarial. It's either uh, you raise money from like an angel who's just doing it because they love it, um, and uh, you can in that case you can write the terms. But angels still want good deals. I mean, especially <laughs> down here in LA. I well, that's around valuation mostly, and then uh, if if it's around if there, if like there's outrageous terms like they're like if they own ten percent of the company and or five percent and they want a board seat or if they want fifty one percent of the cut. Company, I just wouldn't do that deal because it's kind of company enders. Um, so I would just keep the deal very vanilla Silicon Valley style. I wouldn't uh, like change my deal because I'm down in LA. And like I said, the seed rounds are very, there, there's usually no board seat, so that removes a big part of the equation. I mean, tell me if I'm wrong if you guys are seeing board seats. Uh, but there's usually no board seat, so it's usually just around valuation. Uh, and the only trick is minimizing the option pool so it doesn't squeeze your valuation down. So can you talk about that in a little bit more detail? Uh, it's just boring and technical and... Uh, <laughs> uh, VCs, v v VCs like to take the option pool, say it's 15%, uh, and take it out of the pre-money. So that means... Uh, that your real pre-money gets squeezed down by the size of the option pool, as opposed to, say, uh, sharing the hit from the option pool. Uh, it's just, there's no reason for it other than that's just standard. Um, so the deals are really pretty straightforward. Pro rata rights are fine. Liquidation preferences are just going to be 1x. Uh, so for a seed deal, there's not much going on. And the big pieces to watch out for are board seats and the size of the option pool. Got it. Any, any other thoughts on, on actual, the folks that you've seen that have been the most successful at raising money? Oh, yeah. What do, what do they do different and better? Uh, again, they have something that's really unique. That's, I know things can't be really unique, just unique. Uh, so go to AngelList and see what's trending. It's like, Startup after startup, and they're all doing something cool. Uh, but it, so you want to stand out from even those, which is challenging. Um, and oftentimes they have like great traction when they raise capital. 
uh, or they're just doing something impossibly hard like Uber, uh, or they have a pedigreed team. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, then, in terms of getting a great deal, the best I've seen is there's one of the guys on the team who's raising the money is a bit of a shark um, and uh, knows how to talk and sell, just like a natural salesman. Uh, those guys usually end up getting good deals because they play each side off of each other to some degree and they believe whatever bullshit is coming out of their mouth at the time. <laughs> and so does the VC. So. Got it. Um, and I mean, the other thing is that I found to be helpful, uh, again, this is going out for, to raise cash from VCs, not a angels, because those deals, again, tend to be very friendly, uh, is to just really have a really high anchor. So like, the valuation of this round is $50 million. That's where we're starting, right? And you have to believe that that's what the company is worth. Uh, are you, do you expect that the trend that you're seeing, so in the last six months, terms have become less favorable for entrepreneurs after it kind of reached its peak? Do you think that's going to continue? And, and where do you think it'll settle in the next, call it six to 12 months? I think the terms are still really good for uh, the outliers or things that are close to that. Um, I think the terms for the rest have come down. I don't know where they're going. I don't think... Uh, I think the market for startups in general is fantastic because the uh, market for startups is really the, it's, it's the entire global economy right now. I think every company uh, that's uh, on NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange is going to be replaced one way or another by a company that's a startup right now. And let's call that in the next 25 or 50 years. Uh, so. The, the size of uh, the market for startups is on the same scale as the global economy, in my opinion, which to me says that valuations are going to, over the long term, go up. What are some of the trends that you're seeing that you're most interested in? I, I, I was reading over the blog post that you sent today. I, I, you talked about this really cool concept of hiring and running developers of, of teams of one. Can you, can you talk more about that? I thought that was really cool and, and sent it off to a bunch of our staff to read it over. Sure. Uh, uh, we, we, we call it a one-man startup. So we hire all the guys on our team and girls on our team to be one-man startups. Uh, and uh, what that means is they can ship whatever they want to production whenever they want, essentially. If they want to launch a new feature, they can do it. Uh, they are basically a startup within the context of our own startup. And, uh, but they're also responsible for marketing and, I mean, things much further outside the scope of engineering. Yeah, so you wouldn't want to join our company just to write code or just to be a designer or to be told what to do. By the way, I'm not saying this is a good idea for you or that it even works that well necessarily at Angelus. I think it does work, but it has a lot of side effects, too. D uh, did you push for this philosophy? I mean, was this the kind of the... Yeah, this is what we did when we first started. I think it's, it's basically like a little internal economy that we have. Uh, so you do your work. If you need help, you pull it. Uh, so, so sometimes people might push some help on you and say, you know what, this part wasn't very good. You should do it like this. Um, but it's kind, of like a, it's kind of modeled after the way that the internet is, which is everything is loosely coupled but independent. Do you see any company, larger companies doing at scale more employees, you know, a company with 100, 500 employees? How far up do you think that management model scales? Uh, well, I, I mean, I think we're all probably copying a bit off of Facebook. Uh, so, like, I don't know if they, uh, what their procedures are for people to ship to production, but uh, my guess is uh, if you're not building a new feature, that's, it's not that hard to, to fix up. Something. I know uh, WordPress is a distributed workforce, and they're pushing, I think, yeah. dozens of pushes a day. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, so that's an open source project. Mozilla is probably another good example. Uh, both of those co companies probably make a lot of money, but I don't think they're great examples because they're probably never going to be Google or Facebook or Apple or whatever, just because they're so. Uh, I think even their strategies are up for debate by like the whole o o open source community, which is. 
uh, not a recipe for great success. Uh, GitHub is probably a good example of that. Uh, they're a special case just because they're developers writing features for developers, so they tend to know what other developers want. So what are you mostly, uh, what, what are you mostly doing day to day? How closely are you managing AngelList these days? I'm there full time. Um, everyone's there full time. N N Vol's full time. Uh, I tend to work on product, like PMing stuff. So how are you, how, if you, if you haven't raised any money, yeah. and you're not making any money, how are you paying well, we, for the salary? Well, we raised some money from the Coffin Foundation. Okay. Yeah. And is that still what's paying for those 13 employees? Uh, it's, it's paying for some of it, I think. And then the rest are just working for tricks and... <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Got it. I swear I read something. It's not, it's not like breaking your office and went through your folder. I okay. swear I read something that you guys raised money. Um, so you also talk about this idea that a startup's mission should be to literally save the world, right? Can you talk about that? And, and if your mission is anything less than save, saving the world, are you not doing a good job? Are you saying your site's too low in your opinion? Uh, I think uh, first thing is just show up to work and do whatever you're doing. That's the first step, right? You know what I mean? Because I've been, that's really uh, strange advice, but I've been quite bad at that in my life. Uh, so like whatever you're doing, just do it. Um, and Wait, then, what, what exactly have you been bad at? Sh showing up to work. Got it. Uh, and, is that uh, a good quality to have if you're no, <laughs> running a company? No, no, I don't mean right now. I mean it's in the past. Previously. Yeah. Got it. Uh, the garage band. Yeah, the garage band. Uh, so uh, I would just say wherever you are, I think uh, if you can take it to a place where you are truly changing or saving the world, I think that's what you want to do just because startups are, I think they're one of the best forces for good in the world, if not the greatest force for good in the world, other than say government, um, which you can, it's, it's hard to start one of those. Uh, but it's really easy to start a startup. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, re religions, despite all the downsides, they're also great for for forces for good in the world, but those are also hard to start. But any of us can start a startup. Uh, so it's your opportunity and chance it's to... It's funny, when Alana and I started DocStock, we had, a, we had a, this large sheet of paper, and, the, and we had three options. One was startup, and the other two were start a government and religion. And we're lucky we picked Sorry, sorry, it's worked yeah. out well for us so far. Nice. Nice. I often think we should have started the religion, but yeah. That would be fun. Yeah. Who are uh, the, what, are the, what are the companies right now, and don't say somebody big like, you know, Google or, like, what are, what are some of the younger companies that you think are just killing it and doing an awesome job that everybody else can learn from, and why? Uh, I love Uber just because what they're doing is so hard and they're getting sued all the time and that's that's fantastic uh, and it's a great product right uh, th product. that we all probably use uh, at, that they charge money for uh, so that's I love that uh, who else do I really love right now um, what new startups are you personally using what apps yeah what, what oh products? Munchery is great which is like uber for food they, uh, they don't have it here but they have it in San Francisco uh, it's really e easy. It's, it's online chef, so it's private chefs online. And you just go to montreal.com, you say what food you want for the week, they have pictures of the meals, it's all, they say if it's organic or vegetarian or whatever, uh, you pick it and they deliver it uh, at, you know, between 5 and 6 p.m. You can pick the time. Uh, I'm not an investor in it, but they use a Angelus to raise money. How many companies have you personally invested in? Uh, one. I'm not really an investor. Uh, uh, so Montreal's awesome. I give them lots of money, like I give Uber lots of money. Uh, so I love that. And anything that's like solving a really hard problem and also like trying to make the offline world come online, I, I love those companies. Um, yeah. What Got do you like? What are the companies that I'm really liking? Yeah. Uh, I like stuff in the small business space. So I like Trinet. things like, yeah, all the sponsors, they're awesome. Um, I, I, I like, I tend to like products like, um, well, in the business, I like things like FreshBooks that just take something so simple, like you need to send an invoice, and it just they've built an awesome business around that. Our guest last time was uh, Dave Goldberg, SurveyMonkey. I think that's an awesome company. Mm. 
I'm also really fascinated with, because um, I'm, I'm not single anymore, but all the dating apps that just do exactly what you said, so the Tinders, that just kind of match people. I really like this concept that you anonymously say, hey, I'm interested in you, somebody else is the same thing, and it just kind of breaks down that friction. Yeah. Those are the kinds of things that I'm liking. Um, what, what's your relationship, what's like your and Naval's relationship now with all these investors? I mean, you're, you're kind of the gatekeepers. You're, you're, not, you're the gatekeepers for this deal flow to investors. Just talk about that relationship, and you must constantly have investors that are like, hey, show me the really good deal. Give it to me first. Like, yeah. give it to me before somebody else. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, we're not, I, I mean, investors have their own deal flow, so they don't, you know, necessarily uh, need us to live or die. Uh, they all want to see deal flow early. Obviously, we don't do that. Uh, Naval is great at just like, and we've got another guy on the team too who's like kind of like investor relations. Uh, so he just keeps them happy and pumped up. Um, and uh, I try to like focus on product that's going to be good for the startup. And uh, I don't really think about what the investors need or want. I mean, not what they need or want, but like, um, I. Uh, he, he's just good at making them happy about whatever we're doing, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I don't focus on. Can you talk a little about in, in the very beginning, right, when there was nothing there except a woofu form and a blog post, how, how, did, you really, how did you really get a, both a large enough number of investors and then a large enough number of companies and make it work? Because my guess is you weren't the first person to try to do something like this, but you guys made it, you guys made it stick. Uh, it was kind of like the Facebook model in the sense that we started off with Harvard and then everybody wanted to be on the same social network as the Harvard kids. Uh, so we started off with our friends who were just like the top end investors. Uh, and then uh, if you think Reed Hoffman is active on AngelList, he's not active on AngelList, it's not the best place in the world to meet Reed, uh, then you come and sign up as an investor. Um, and then we did the same thing with uh, startup deal flow as well. We had good deal flow ourselves, and we just, instead of investing in it ourselves, we just shared it with the investors and said, hey, you should take this deal. Who do you think are some of the, who are the, some of the angel investors that you respect the most? That you think are the best at what they do? Oh, um, I, don't, I, I don't have a great answer to that. Mitch is great, Mitch Kapoor is awesome, Matt Mullenweg is great, Darmesh Shah is great, but I'm, I'm leaving off like hundreds of people, uh, and uh, you can go to AngelList and it's really easy, there's a list of investors and the cool thing about it is you can sort them by like something we call signal, which is kind of like a measure of their quality. And what are you using to determine that? Their track record. Well that's cool. Nivi, thank you for sharing your insights, thank you for sharing your time. Venture Hacks is amazing, you're doing so much to help so many of the folks in this room and everywhere else realize their dreams, and I just wanted to say thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for coming. <laughs>